welcome you to our scholarship and millennial the lecture series sponsored by Bowie the Bureau of Library. Scholarship at Millennial event dedicated to recognition of these scholarly publications, ongoing research, and other intellectual contributions of faculty members from all four colleges of Villanova University. This afternoon, we are pleased to have with us Dr. Ronald Hill, Richard J. Martin, a Clario Chair, a Professor of Marketing and Business Law in the Villanova School of Business. Dr. Hill earned his PhD in Business Administration at the University of Maryland in 1984. His study focused on work <coughs> as well as organizational behavior, documenting politics. Dr. Hill has published extensively with hundreds of journal articles, book chapters, and professional press. He also uh, published multiple books on marketing, public policy, and related topics. In today's talk titled, A Manifesto on Marketing as Exchange, Dr. Hill will discuss real threats that the discipline of marketing has to face and offer perspectives on new frames to guide the field. He will invite us to consider the fuller role of marketing so that new generations of scholars and practitioners recognize the inestimable value of all human beings. So let me not ruin the excitement and welcome back to Thank you. I hope you're applauding her because uh, I don't want to put me out there as having earned anything yet. So I was in a plane coming back from Las Vegas. That's bad enough. It was actually an intellectual conference there. And I sat next to a really engaging man from uh, Tel Aviv. And so I really enjoyed it. He was quirky and fun, but he was sick. And so now I have exactly the same cough that he had on the plane. Of course, we know that planes are uh, wonderful places to catch all kinds of interesting stuff. So I'm not at my, I'm not at my optimal, but I'm going to try to be as optimal as I can be. I, I want to begin by telling you why I'm here and why I wrote this particular paper. Uh, ab about 1988-1989, I was teaching at Cornell University as a visitor, so that meant that I had one year there. And it was before I came to Villanova the very first time. I've, I've done two tours of duty here, or, or as I work at Graterford Prison. You know, I had two bids. And so uh, during my, during my uh, first bid, I really concentrated my attention on figuring out how people survived in a material world who were relatively impoverished. And so I worked with six different subsets of poor people. And I did it all over the world, but concentrated. I kind of like the kind of the urban poverty uh, focus, and have gone to looking at global poverty. So I've looked at poverty in a wide variety of contexts and how it intersects with the material world, and it has been really truly a labor of love. And I've gotten to know some extraordinary people who suffer from some very difficult circumstances. I'm just going to give you an example. I met a man today who just got released from Graterford. Uh, his brother wanted us to meet him because he was afraid he would go back into drugs. And I just think about this man's life as he described it to us today. By the age of six, he was taken away from his parents. His father ended up spending, from the time this young, this man's 40, so he's still young in my mind. Um, from the time this young man was six, his father was in prison, and his mother went in and out of, of drug problems and rehab, et cetera. And so, of course, he ended up uh, in trouble. And I keep thinking about how fortunate so many of us are to have had the lives that we have had. I'm not necessarily blame. He'll say to you, you know, a lot of people end up, start out like me, don't end up like I did. But he's trying now to do something else for himself. And so I've learned to take great pride in the people that I've met over the course of my career. And in doing so, I began to see kind of a pattern emerging. And the pattern it really bothered me, in part because it's so intuitively obvious that you think our field would understand it, and it's a shock that they don't. So we tend to concentrate in business on about 15 percent of the world population at the very top of the, what you call the economic pyramid, rather than the six billion people who are not part of that particular segment. And it bothered me because I didn't think that those six billion people operate and live a life that is associated with what that top billion does. So why hasn't our field looked at it? Now the easy answer is 
well, they don't buy as much, and so we only care about those who buy as much. But that says something callous about the field. And it also doesn't say anything theoretically about what the field should be about, which is if we're going to have a field called consumer behavior, and it's the largest segment of marketing scholars uh, in our profession, you would think that they would want to capture all of what consumer behavior is. So I've been carrying this torch for a while now. Um, six or eight people in the whole world listen to me about it. But at any rate, I decided that I would, uh, I got an opportunity to write something for the woman, the Indian woman who is now head of, of um, PepsiCo. And she's had difficulty, so I'm not suggesting she's moved in the direction she wanted to. But she gets in and she looks around and says, what is our bioeconomic footprint in the world? She goes, we're the number one cause of obesity in, in developed nations. And what we do is we throw sodium on top of that. So, and of course, a lot of people will say, well, no one's putting a gun to their head. They're buying it because they want it. You are serving the marketplace. But her reaction to that is, it's not enough. And she's had all kinds of difficulties as a result of that. But I got an opportunity to write something. A consultant who works for her, who uh, Ronte and I have worked with here, he's the branding guy that we met. He's a pen guy. And he said, do you mind if I, if you put it in writing, I'd like to send it to her. Now, she never responded to it. And I never gave her the paper. But I sent the idea of this paper to an editor. And I said, do you have any interest in this? And so I bothered to write the paper. And I'm still waiting to hear back from him. Uh, because it's very, it will be incredibly controversial. It will take a lot of courage on his part to publish it. It doesn't take nearly as much courage to write it because, because nobody sits around and thinks, I'm going to give them something mainstream, right? I mean, how many people in the business school concentrate on poverty? I, I can literally tell you in my field, I know everyone who does in my field. But it would take a lot of courage on his part, and I'm not sure. So we'll see. Anyway. I want to I want to go through a few things for you. I want to look at what I call the orthodoxy, the the orthodoxy of the field, and I want to and I want to punch some holes in it, and it doesn't mean that everybody's going to agree with it. Well, we may have the converted here, but not everybody will agree with it. I can certainly tell you in the field, people don't necessarily agree with it. I'm giving this talk at Boston College in, I think, three weeks. And I just gave it at Florida State University um, fairly recently, I think about a month ago now. And they kind of look at it like, OK, so it's kind of motherhood-ish. But we think it might be unrealistic. So I'm going to try to get to the place where I think, no, it's wholly realistic. Um, but it's still difficult to do. Okay, So I've already talked a little bit about limited marketplace consideration. Uh, let me spend just another moment on it. So we have this giant mass of humanity. And it depends upon how you calculate it. I mean, we know we talk about the bottom of the pyramid. And so we have this cutoff of two and a half dollars a day. And as some students will say, well, maybe they live in places where two and a half dollars goes a long way. There's no such thing. And then, then there's a massive poverty at, you know, at half of that. Okay. But if you try to take a look at that pyramid, the way in which I've cut it off with my co-authors is 85% of society suffers from major restrictions in their capability of buying the goods and services they feel they need. Now, there's some cultural distinctions that make a difference. So, for example, if you're in the United States, you reflect on what you need differently than if you're in Sierra Leone. Okay? Clearly, that's true. But it's 85% of humanity, serious restraints. Now, I worked with a scholar in my field who's a brilliant guy named Don Lehman, and he said, everybody's got constraints, no matter how much money they've got. You know, Donald Trump, well, he can't, well, I don't know, that's a bad example. But, uh, but um, Bill Gates, even though he has all the money he wants, can't have everything he wants. And I go, yes, but that's really different than wondering whether you're going to survive or not. And so that 85% deals with serious issues associated with their survival. And so it's a mass of humanity, and it's amazing to me that you can ignore that and still say that the theoretical ways in which you're conducting this understanding of marketing exchanges is reflective of humanity. Um, I was, it's funny because I was talking to, no, talking to, I, you know, we use that now, emailing back and forth, talking to. Uh, it's like putting bags on your head and passing notes back and forth. But anyway, I'm 
emailing back and forth with this really terrific scholar at the University of Minnesota. And she s I told her that I was working at Graterford and I wanted to write a paper on the abrogation of the will. I'm not a philosopher, though I play one on television. And I work with uh, Jim Wetzel a lot, and he is a philosopher, so he's, he's schooled me a fair amount. And I really want to say, well, here's a place where there's a licit market in Graterford. Okay, I, I mean, I'm, act, I'm acting as if we all know. It's a maximum security prison, and I work primarily with men who have life sentences, right? And I teach in our program, but I also do some other work with these men as well. And I'm there probably one day a week, and it's been over, a little bit over a year. But I, I said to her, you know, I have all these data from these men, and she said, well, but we need, does it have this right psychometric properties? She goes, is it generalizable? I want to do an, a, an experiment where I put 50 students in a room and see whether or not, you know, we, when we manipulate things in a purer way, whether it will show the same results you get in that messy environment that's greater for it. Well, I've run into that a lot. I have people saying, you can't say it's true, even though you've looked at 50,000 people in the third world, what we call the developing world now. You can't say it's true unless you do it as in using an experimental paradigm. So I'm actually competing in my research against people that take 50 Hong Kong students, put them in a room, and try to manipulate them as if they were at the bottom of the pyramid, where I'm really honestly looking at people who live in that place. And so I, it's amazing to me how many scholars and others that are doing theory work think that the kind of work you have to do, the messy work you have to do at the bottom of the pyramid, isn't valid. Therefore, there's no value in having done it. And I say, that can't be true, and it isn't true, because life isn't about going in and making everything identical except for this one sliver running 50 people through it, and then saying it's generalizable to some kind of population. It just isn't. All right, this is <coughs> the second is what I call alienation from the marketplace. And part of that alienation comes from, you know, being, being dis not included. We, when I was, a, I was a dean in South Florida for a little while, I guess three years, and I invited this friend of mine, who's an African-American scholar named Jerome Williams. He came out and he spoke about the prejudices, how they manifest in the South in retail environments. And what I was trying to do when I was there, I was trying to invite the African-American community to us because literally where many of them live in the St. Pete area, buttressed up against our university, but like a lot of universities, these people never had been there. They viewed us as something with benign neglect. So I tried to include the community. So I had a, a scholar come in to speak, and on this side were a group of African-American residents of the local community. On this side were the scholarly group, you know, our faculty and other folks. And he was talking about um, the way in which prejudice or discrimination occurs. And when he did so, the people on this side said, well, that's the easy problem to fix. But then the African-American consumer said, oh, no, you, you no, know, we would never do it. So an example was this woman, um, and there's a department store in Florida that has known to do this kind of discrimination. She was back in the changing room. She had changed. As she came out, she saw one of those, you know, those white hooks they put on your clothes so you can't really tell what you look like other than having a tumor on your side. And it was sitting on the ground. And she saw it and walked around it, handed her clothes back, and then the manager went back, saw it on the ground, and came after her. Now, the white people in the audience said, using their own lenses, said, well, why didn't you just pick it up and give it to the manager? And all the African Americans in the audience said, oh, no, that would have just been admission. She stole something. They go, no, no, it wouldn't. And so it's kind of a different set of lenses. But I've noticed this with a, a number of groups that I've worked with. It's a sense of not belonging. And we have this uh, very talented African-American scholar in our marketing department named, named Arante Bennett. And she and I have done some work. And we are actually finding that the marketplace, the retail marketplace, has moved from overt discrimination, no blacks allowed, uh, no Mexicans allowed, to failure to include. Okay, so you know that you can, on one hand, it's 
the kind of discrimination that people can be held accountable for in today's society. On the other hand, it's different when you don't include somebody. You're not actively excluding them, but you're failing to include. And this alienation, interestingly, is not ju doesn't just occur with individuals who are lower, on the st lower on the, in the marketplace. There's actually alienation that occurs in the marketplace for people who are higher, that occupy that top 15%. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because it's really not something that I'm as interested in. Um, but it's throughout the marketplace. And part of it, and I think part of the alienation is because of something I call commoditization of exchange partners. So even though much of the literature today on selling and marketing, because I know there are a few of you who are marketing professors in here, and you think of selling as the approach, but the ways in which we communicate and work with consumers it's based on a kind of a relationship approach. My moving is really makes it hard for you, doesn't it? My moving is hard for you, isn't it? All right, but I can't stand in one place. I won't stand very long. Okay. Um, part, part, so back to commoditization. Part of it is that um, even though we talk about relationships, we really don't talk about relationships. Unless you think of relationships as only having instrumental value. And any of you who are parents know that your children have very little instrumental value, particularly when they're young. And when they get older, they just become less lovable and more expensive. So that's, at least that's what I found with my own children, particularly at college age. The only time they were nice to me is when they needed money, right? You know, Dad, how are you? And I go, oh, I'm in trouble now. But what I'm trying to get to here is part of the alienation is because of commodification. It's the alienation occurs because what we've done is we've stripped you of your identity. Now, I can make it as simple as possible by telling you that um, this is Greg Bonner. He's our department chair of marketing. Uh, I think he's going into his 18th year doing that job. I, 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so what do the students know him as? They know him as his, their department chair, right? They don't know him as a father. They don't know him as a husband. They don't know him as a lover. They don't know him as a teammate. They know this one sliver of who he is, and they identify him as such, as if it captures his identity. And this is the problem with, I think, with marketing as well. Even in those cases at the top of the pyramid, what we have done is we've stripped you of a lot of what makes you human and replaced that with those things that give us instrumental value. And if you don't fall into that bandwidth that gives you instrumental value, then we will ignore you completely. Okay? And so I think that is part of it. The other is the, what I call faulty performance measurement. So if you commoditize people and you only are concerned about characteristics that serve your value, then how do you measure? How do you measure what success is? So in marketing, common measures are attempts to go back to what the organization cares about, right? So fundamentally, virtually every undergraduate business student here can say, you know, that the, that the primary purpose of the business is to bring profit to its owners. Now, I don't know why that orthodoxy still exists, because it's, it, it was never, it's rarely true, and it's certainly not true in most cases. Even the, even the most utilitarian organizations I've been about were more about maintaining their jobs of the managers who were running the place than they were about making anybody profitable. They would make people profitable if that met their own set of interest. But they don't say unselfishly what I'd like to do, no matter what it does to me, is to make the owners profitable. So it's, it's a misnomer to some extent. But what, what do we measure? We measure things that allow us to quantify what we think turns out to be reality. So we want to measure profitability. So how does marketing intersect with profitability? We look at things like market share. What percent of whatever fixed pie exists out there of people interested in our product or interested in this product category, what percent do we have? Now stop and think just a minute about that pie analogy. If PepsiCo wants to get larger market share who do they have to cannibalize in order to get there? They got to go after Coke, right? Because it's, the rest of them are small fish mostly. I mean, they, they have, you got, 
And what does Coke say? Well, if Pepsi would like a larger market share, that's good for us. No, they fight tooth and nail for it. And so what, what happens with a lot of these measures is they, they take on a life of their own that doesn't take into account any constituency at all. Doesn't take into account owners, doesn't take into account necessarily managers, and certainly doesn't take into account the well-being of the consumer class that they, that they work with. But why do we hold to these measures over decades, if not hundreds of years? We hold to them because they are simple to measure. It's like cats, okay, for those that are professors in here. It's like, why do we, oh, does, is there any professor who sits and says, you know that cats, they really capture the essence of who I am as a professor. Almost no one has ever said that to me, but I don't think I've ever been, you know, as a dean and a department chair at one time, been in meetings where we didn't say there are 4.2 and the average is 4.3 in the department, as if that measures reality. Why do we do it? Because they're simple, easy to understand, and, they, and they're around. And getting, the ch and getting people to change is difficult. So if we don't care about you, and we allow you to be alienated, we commoditize you, and then we measure you in ways that don't make any sense, what does it say about managers? There's this really, uh, she's older now, her name's Pat Warhane. she's the ethics person at DePaul, she's also at UVA, but I think she stopped going there because she's, she's getting older, but she's a really interesting lady, and she talks about this idea of the moral imagination. She talks about, you know, levels of moral development, and Gene Lasniak and Pat Murphy and some of these other folks in marketing that are constantly looking at what we do, they almost invariably find us stuck at a lower level. Stuck. Even when they talk about corporate social responsibility and its connection to the marketing discipline, Almost invariably, they talk about it as if, well, if you do that and your consumers know, then they're more likely to buy. And there's another vein that says, and if you're CSR oriented, then you're less likely to do things that are unethical, and then you're less likely to get in trouble. What well, reminds me of my kids when they were little. You know, they want the cookie, but I tell them, if you don't take the cookie now, I'll give you the cookie later. They really want the cookie. And they're even looking, is he looking at me? You know. But they're doing it, and they're, I'm, excuse me, they're not doing something because they feel that doing something is going to bring them greater harm. So it's a lower level. Now, part of the problem with a lot of this work is when you get to a particular level of moral development, moral imagination, it says it, it, it portends that managers then become selfless. So we all, sit on, we all sit on the height of a mountain, we cross our legs, you know, uh, the, our inner Buddha, of course I'm a Catholic, our inner Christ comes out, and then we, we feel good about the world now. Now all of a sudden we're this selfless individual. And that's not true either. Okay? So part of the reason why we haven't looked at a lot of that work, other than we talk to ourselves in ethics about it, is because that ideal doesn't seem to work as well. So, so the, the low level is, is a problem. The idea that what marketers do, in fact, Lasniak and Murphy have these five different levels of ways in which marketers can be categorized according to their moral imagination or their ethical background. Four of them are hideous. There's one that they put in there. Now, I don't, they don't say, t and it's 20% for each grouping. It, they don't. But they're capturing the discipline in a way that suggests that there is a lot of malfeasance going on. And why wouldn't there be? I have two colleagues that I've worked with. We've actually looked at both Buchenwald and we've looked at Auschwitz. Believe it or not, you can find all kinds of ways to bring marketing into it. Anyway, we're looking at the exchange systems that existed in these places, and one of the things we looked at was the commodification of the men and women who were there. I mean, at Greaterford now, when you go in, most of the men I work with go in between 14 and 19 years of age. They go in, they're given a number, and that's all they, that's all they use to try to identify them any longer. They give them a health check, they check all their orifices to make sure they didn't bring anything in they shouldn't bring in. They de-louse them, they give them their two of everything, two pairs of socks, two shoes, one pair of shoes, you know, two browns, the stuff that they wear, and then they ask them, 
just imagine you're 15 years old. Uh, I'm not saying these men didn't commit crimes, they did. But these lifers, they asked them, where do you want the body delivered when you die? Which is their way of signaling to them, you ain't ever, you know, you're welcome to Pennsylvania. You ain't ever getting out. Okay. And of course, they fight against that over time. Well, that kind of commodification allows us to operate as if they're other. And if you've ever watched a lot of the people who are, who can depersonalize, if not dehumanize, the people that they're dealing with, they, they no longer represent a human being. Right? So the, when the government sets safety standards, as an example, they don't set safety standards and go, every life is precious. They set safety standards and say, okay, what's the cost-benefit trade-off for this? Companies do it, too, do it as well. All these famous examples of Pento and all these other famous examples, it was companies sitting, sitting around and deciding, is it worth it to fix the problem uh, versus whatever money we're going to have to pay out because of damages to individuals. It reminds me of something that my father-in-law, who was a great guy, said to me. He grew up on a farm in Brownsville, Pennsylvania, and he said, the cows that we were going to eat as food, we never gave them a name. The cows that were milk cows and were quasi-pets, we gave them names. And that's a, way, that's a way to push something off as other. The last part of this is this whole idea of the bioeconomy. Now, there's this brilliant guy, he's got to be 85 years old, named um, Bill Frederick. I've been trying to get him out here, but he's not at a stage in his life where he's, one, he's well, I'm almost there now at 58, where uh, I said, I don't need to go anywhere anymore. You know, if I get invited to give a talk, I go, okay, if, if it's not going to be fun, I'm not going. So I couldn't get Bill to come out. I actually wanted him to come to the prison, too, and his wife is ill. But at any rate, he has this whole bioeconomy that he talks about. He said, you know, the whole idea that businesses operate in and of themselves, put, we can put blinders on and say, this is what we do in the world, he says, just is untrue. You know, it's like a drop of water in a pond and watching the ripples go throughout. He says, we live in a systemic world where the repercussions are huge. Now, you, you don't have to spend a lot of time trying to figure that out, right? We get a little blip in the Japanese stock exchange and we watch it ripple until it becomes a tidal wave when it passes over Europe or the United States. You know, wh why does this happen? It happens because at some level, all of this is interconnected. And I bring that up now because I think it represents a set of challenges that we have not thought much about. So, for example, if Pepsi, when PepsiCo came out and said, by the way, did I tell you that they said they were going to become a health and wellness firm? Yeah, that's what she said. I got it in writing. I saw it. When they did that, Coca-Cola came out with their own campaign on the same topic. It reminds me of Dave Wendy. If you remember back to Wendy's, there was Dave Wendy. It looks like he said, here's the funny little French food, and here's, here's, what, you know, here's a double Wendy burger with extra, extra bacon. You know, he made it to about 63, eating his own food, right? So McDonald's tried to make healthier food. It always failed for them because they're just not that place. But Wendy said, no, we're not going to. You want healthy food? Go someplace else. So Coca-Cola did the same thing. They have a new campaign, and it basically says, all calories count. All calories count. It's reminiscent to me of the tobacco companies that said, there are lots of things in the air that can hurt your lungs. How can you differentiate which part of that was the smoke that you inhaled, or inhaled because your mother smoked, okay? or it was asbestos or something else in the environment? Hard to know. Okay? Coca-Cola said, it ain't us. Well, what's the repercussions of that? I mean, you can pretend, you can put on the blinders and say, we're going to fight what's going on here, or you can be like Pepsi and try to open up the aperture and fight internally about whether or not that's appropriate. Well, what's happening with soft drinks? We've got a city now, the largest city in the United States, that wants to regulate how much you can drink. Okay, you're going to have two to make a giant gulp, but you've got to drink them one at a time. right? Now, all of a sudden, you're going in these restaurants, and you're going in looking at fast food restaurants, and they have the calories up here. I don't know about you, 
and I'm fairly enlightened about these things. You know, this body's a temple. No one worships here, but it's still a temple. Okay. I look at this, and all of a sudden I go, oh my God, there's 550 calories in that muffin? You know, and it's 50% fat? You know, you start looking at that. That is an outgrowth. Schools for years had these soft drink machines, right? They were in every school, every place. Universities made a ton of money on them. Remember, you were either a Coke place or a Pepsi place. They're all over the place. Now they're removing them in droves. Okay. Why? Because there's a renewed focus that's coming to us from Scandinavia and Europe that says, we are looking at the well-being of the people that you serve. We're not looking at what you call satisfaction, which is a whole different set of terms. Okay, so there are challenges to the orthodoxy. So, what can we do? Well, so one direction is this ideal of diversity. Now, marketers for a long time have cared deeply about diversity because what they do is they find that if I give you generic product, if I give you generic soda, Coca-Cola or PepsiCo, of course, they view them as radically different, which is why you go into restaurants and you say, I'll have a Coke, and they go, we only have Pepsi, and you say, it's the same thing. They have to say because they got sued so many times. Coca-Cola went around the country. I don't know if they went around the world, but they at one time went around the country busting any, any restaurant that said it was Coke when they were serving Pepsi or some other generic soft drink because they didn't want to be Xerox. You know, they didn't want to be Q-tips. They didn't want to be the generic name for a soft drink. They wanted to maintain what they thought was their own brand identity. And when I go in now and I look at, well, I don't. My wife picks all this stuff out. She doesn't let me go to the supermarket with her because I always go to the dented aisle, you know, the dented cans without labels on them. And I go, that could be Denny Moore stew. We ate that when I was a kid. Or Spam, remember Spam? You can tell, look at that little key on the top. That was good stuff. Yes, it was. Okay, it was a meat-like product. You know, it was. It's a meat like, meat like. My father ate scrapple. He's from the South, so what can I say? Um, what we what we do if you go into one of these aisles and look at look at toothpaste, look at shampoo, look at soft drinks, you will see this cornucopia of stuff. Just imagine if you wanted to go in and get the optimal toothpaste for you. If you truly were set on optimizing the toothpaste. That's why so many, when you ask our students what toothpaste do you use, the one we used at home. Now, everyone says it's nostalgia, bringing a little piece of home here, but a lot of it is, it's just easier. Do you really want to go in and look at, well, you obviously care about your hair, both of you, but do you really want to go in and, and look at all the shampoos and try them over time and see which one works best? Almost nobody is willing to put that energy into it. So the diversity really is not about you as an individual. It's about breaking the market into smaller and smaller pieces and then trying to own that turf. It's like taking the hill. Okay, I'm, I'm a, I love the Civil War stuff and so I'm, you know, I was looking at um, some of the stuff that's coming out now because we're at the, what, 100 and Sesquicentennial, thank you very much. I was here for Villanova's Sesquicentennial of Gettysburg will be this summer in early July. And you're looking at each piece, you know, each piece of the puzzle, you know, each piece of that property. And that's what marketers do. Now, we can say that that's a concern about diversity, a diversity of taste, a diversity of person, but really it goes back to the same instrumental value. What they don't value is the individual consumer's diversity. So I'm going to give you an example that might bring this home. I'll use you, but um, you're Asian American, right? No, I'm Asian Asian. Asian Asian? Where are you from? I'm from Vietnam. Vietnam? Okay. Do you know Lon Chaplin, our professor in the business school? No. Oh, you should meet her. She's wonderful. Okay. So she's Vietnamese. Good example. No, she's a, no. Well, we're going to use you anyway. Oh, okay. So there's one way in which I could I could look at this young woman, and I could say I can define her for you. She's 18 to 25. Okay. She's 
from a family that's middle class or higher. She has a certain education level. Okay? I may even be able to define that because she's here at Villanova, that there's a certain amount of style because the, we all know that Villanova men can do anything they want. They can get up any time they want and show up, but the women have to get decked. Right? That's just the way that works for whatever reason. So I could define you by three or four characteristics. In fact, marketers can now define who you are in ways where they know you better than you sometimes think you might know yourself. CVS, and we talk about this, this is one of our famous marketing examples now, sent a letter to a young woman, um, and I think some samples, right, to her, because she was pregnant and wanted to capture her target. target was it Target? Early on, she was just at the start of her pregnancy, they knew it. Her father gets a hold of this stuff and calls him and reads him the riot act. Then he finds out later his daughter is pregnant. But all they did was track, you know how you use all your little swiping things that you can use everywhere? I pull them all together and I have a composite of who you are. But it doesn't tell us much about who you are, it tells you what you are but it doesn't look at the individual diversity of who you are. So as I said that Greg Bonner, I could say, he's a professor of marketing. And so the marketing textbook people say, well, what courses do Greg teach? And he says he teaches marketing management. So he's a professor at Villanova, teaches marketing management. What book does he use? And they'll pick a particular book, and then they'll try to work around that book and say, well, we've got a new offering for Greg. They don't say, um, are you married? Do you have children? Are you happy in your job? Do you like teaching marketing management? Are you physically healthy? Are you physically unwell? You know, they, don't, they don't know all of that. Now you can say, and people do, well, that's not their job to know all of that about who you are. Their job is to intersect with you in ways that allow us to sell you products that you feel are worth more than the money you give up, and for us to be able to make some, pro to be profitable as a result of that. But we also know that many of the products that we buy and use over time, from a marketing perspective, come together to create an important component of whether or not an, an individual ha is happy, is satisfied with their life. Okay. And they don't tend to uh, focus on that. I think we need to expect more from people in my profession. We tend to concentrate on what they do. So, well, there's, a, you know, I use Coca-Cola and PepsiCo, but we'll go to Coca-Cola for a minute. I remember I was in a meeting where the president of Coca-Cola, and he's, it's not the pre current president, this was years ago, when I was in, it, I was in Atlanta. He got up and, and an Indian doctoral student said to him, where, what is Coca-Cola's um, corporate social responsibility? And he said, we have one responsibility, profitability for our owners. Next question. And he said, flat out, that's what we do. Okay, well, and when you ask them to explain why they think that that's legitimate, they don't do, no one does that in my mind, but that why they think that's legitimate, they'll say because we've been entrusted with the assets of the owners and our moral obligation is to use those assets to their fullest capability to serve this group of people. And there have been many people throughout the history of business study that have marched along with that moniker. But that doesn't take you into account some things that have societal impact. So, for example, what don't you do? An example of that is who really needs your product? Not who are you selling it to, but who can you best serve by what you do? It's not a particularly great example, but it's an example, and since we're in an academic environment, I'll use it. So when I was a dean in South Florida, the president of the system, who wasn't particularly forward-thinking, said she wanted to be, wanted USF to be one of the top 50 public research universities in the nation. That was her goal. And said, well, how do you do that? Said, one way you do that is by having really good students. So that's one of the reasons why Villanova is highly ranked, because we get such great kids here. So we were an urban university. And we had an urban charge to help the people locally. It's not, wasn't a, it was, I mean, it had people from all over the world, like, you know, 
every school says. We got one person from South Dakota. Yeah, I, you know, I hear that a lot when I speak, so that's okay. Um, they were an urban university whose role it was to serve this group that wasn't going to the University of Florida, that wouldn't end up in a place like Villanova. Who's going to educate them if we stop? And her reaction was, basically, I don't care. Here's my goal. It's sitting out there. That makes us a more prestigious university. Therefore, that's where we've got to go. University of Maryland at College Park, where I was a student, undergrad through doctorate, when, we, when, I was, when I was there, if you came from a school like I did, I went to Good Council High School in Wheaton and had good grades, they'd come in and they'd just sign you up. Now, most of the kids that are in that community can't get in. Why? Well, they've decreased the undergraduate body by 10,000 people from the time I was there. Decreased it. And they pay their faculty about twice as much as what, I don't know how they do it, but twice as much as they did when I was there. And they want to be an elite public university. So they decided they're not going to educate the people in the community. The doctoral students are almost invariably from some other part of the world, yet one of their charges is to serve their community and they don't bring in any doctoral students anymore because from, from in and around Maryland, they don't do it anymore because they think our doctoral program is valued by what our test scores are. And so many of the Asian students do much better in the mathematics so they'll bring them in and put them in the doctoral program because they think it serves their own value. But they're not worried about the state in which they're embedded, you know, in which they rely for much of what they get. Um, and I, I want to talk a little bit about this systemic thinking and doing. I've been thinking about this a lot. I teach this course that where we have every MBA, I'm really proud of it, and I get every MBA student in, in the, in, at Villanova, well, not the e, well, I teach EMBAs, but they're not in this program, but every MBA student here has to go through a module where they must go and serve a nonprofit organization at about the middle of their career. It's been very successful, not because I'm doing such a great job at it, I'm, I'm basically guiding and directing it. It's because the students get an opportunity to go out and serve the common good. And I literally, when I go in and I teach, there's typically a crucifix up on the wall. And, I'll, and I, a lot of our MBA students, I don't even think they know we're a Catholic university half the time. Certainly don't, what, don't know what uh, Augustanian University is. And so I view it as a lesson. It's an opportunity for me. It's, you know, it's one of those teaching moments to say, you are here, maybe not for the same reason that many of us are here, but this is why we're doing this. Yes, it is going to help develop your career. But that's not the sole purpose of it. We want you to learn how to give back to your community in different ways. I think the same thing happens here with corporate social responsibility. Many firms argue with me that they are social enterprises. So I actually want to change the title. I should talk to Michael because he's, he's our head director. Well, I'm sorry. He's the associate dean of graduate studies. But I want to rename the course you know, it's a nonprofit consulting practicum to the social enterprise consulting practicum. I was actually in a meeting in Vegas and uh, doodling, and I, and I noticed that nonprofit organizations that I work with are moving closer to business entities. They're having to do it because the ways in which they operated previously don't work anymore. They can't just wait for the federal government to throw money at them so they can put an army of social workers out on the street to deal with homeless kids. The model doesn't work anymore. And they've got to find ways to come together and combine and act more like business entities. On the other hand, a lot of for-profit organizations are moving more increasingly towards this social enterprise. Now, I differentiate a social enterprise from other kinds of organizations because a social enterprise embedded within its mission is seeking to serve the common good. Now, I could, we, you know, I've had a lot of arguments, Burke Ward and I have arguments about what the common good means, but I'm trying to use it in the, co in the way in which we tend to do so in a university like this, okay, to serve the common good. It's fine with me that Merck 
has one day a year where they have all their employees go out and do Habitat for Humanity. It's a nice thing. There's nothing wrong with doing it. But that's not the same as having a mission to serve the common good. And so I'm, I get concerned about this corporate social responsibility because we hang our hats on it as if it's a giant part of what organizations do. And if you stop and you look at the amount of money, it may sound big sometimes, $10 million in the community, $20 million in the community. When you're a $2 billion firm, that isn't a lot of money. Right? And if you look at some of the reasons why they do it, I'm trying to get a grant from a bank in our community to, to work with kids in West Philadelphia who are basically the offspring and grandchildren of the men we meet in Graterford to keep them from ending up in Graterford because we have fathers and sons and uncles and cousins and you know the all kinds of people that are related to one another and so we're trying to at our own level trying to break some of that you know um, when I when I um, look at the firm that's shown some interest they're showing interest because they've been given hell for not doing anything in the communities that they serve. You know, we, we look at some of these areas, they are unbanked, and so one of the ways in which we beat on some of these companies is we say, okay, you've got to put money into the community. We're going to force you to have to do that. Right? That doesn't serve very much. And so I'm not against, I actually have a book that I'm editing, and I've asked all these people to write for it, and then I'm going to write the last chapter, and it'll say, wither corporate social responsibility. I honestly believe we're going we're gonna to find a merging together that will be somewhat different. All right, last slide, promise. So I won't summary um, because it is unnecessary. So let me talk about a, the skewed distribution system for, for a moment. So clearly we have a system that's built around a particular set of people, right? That, that doesn't surprise anybody. You know, it doesn't surprise anybody at all. And for the most part, that system seems to work for a particular subset of humanity. But the truth is, it doesn't serve humanity in its entirety. And the marketing profession has done very little to shift that, to change that. Um, some of the unintended negative consequences are societal backlash from this. Right? So... If you, and your, if you have a bad lecture today, I'm sure that never happens to you, Sergey, but if you had a bad lecture today, you probably wouldn't say, my job is on the line. You know, the students are going to riot, they're going to go to my dean, and I'm out of here tomorrow. Okay? So you, we often feel that the consequences are not high. You know? But you probably also realize that that student whose life you touch may change them entirely for the rest of their lives. We all have students that have said, because I met you at this particular place, I took a particular direction. So what are some of the unintended negative consequences? The easiest example of those are some of the sin products we talk about. Smoking, why is smoking a problem? Of course, I was in Vegas. It doesn't appear to be a problem there. It's alive and well in Las Vegas. Okay, they just figured if, you, if you're an addictive personality, that includes gambling, so come on in, smoke as much as you want. They pour drinks down people's throats. At any rate, um, back, 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 to, back to this. So the sin products, what are the, what are the unintended consequences? My mother was a smoker. My mother-in-law was a smoker. They both agreed that it was probably going to kill them someday. Of course, when it happened, they were unhappy with it. But at the time, they thought, well, I'm going to smoke. But people didn't talk about passive smoke, right? There are ordinances now in parts of Montgomery County, Maryland, where if you live in a dwelling that shares the same system, the fear is that the smoke can get into that, and so you can't even smoke there. Okay? In Oregon, when I first moved there in 1996, I was shocked that everybody who smokes takes the bus. That was unbelievable. They're constantly taking buses everywhere they go. What I didn't realize was it was against the law to smoke in front of your building. You know this? People get out in front of the building and do this, right? They banished you to these, well, they, looked like, they looked like those overhangs for a bus stop, right? In the middle of the parking lot, people would go and huddle together under this awning. And it rains eight months a year in Oregon, so they would go and do that. 
All right, so some of the unintended negative consequences, we don't think about them all the time. With these examples, it becomes fairly clear. If you drink and drive, other than problems that you'll have, you may end up hurting somebody, right? So we know we, we can delve into those consequences. What we're talking about here is the fact that very few organizations try to look at all the ripple effects that occur because of what they do and what they fail to do. I mean, there are errors of commission, and there are also errors of omission in terms of, the orga in terms of organization. And it's caused real problems in public perceptions and marketing. There was a study done by this interesting guy. Um, he's in one of the, I think, south of France universities. He went and he just looked at, in the developed world, what do people think about the profession of marketing? And I was talking to a group of undergraduate students today that I was teaching, and I said, so when you go up and tell people you're in marketing, what do they say? And they go, oh my god, how unbelievable. Well, accountancy, they don't say that. Finance, they say that now, but they didn't, they didn't for a long time. Engineers, they don't go, oh yeah, you're an engineer. I mean, they might say you're nerdy and you, where's your pocket protector or whatever. But they don't say, you know, you are making society uh, a worse place. And when you tell them that, they think of all kinds of things that we are supposed to have done, many of which are not true of the profession at all. You know, people say, oh, maybe they have all kinds of ways they can manipulate you. No, hell no. If we know how to manipulate, we'd be as upfront about it as possible. You know, all these, all this sexual innuendo. No, they don't. You know, they throw sex out all the time. I was talking to my undergraduate students and I said, how many of you have really talked about in any of your marketing courses about the intersection between sexuality and marketing techniques? Not one could say, we've ever had a conversation about how sex is used in marketing. And I go, how did you get here to this place where you don't, and they say, oh, we know it, but we've not talked about its meaning. So there are lots of um, perceptions of what we do, that we create illusions that are not true, that we take advantage of people, that we sell to children things that they don't need, that their parents would prefer that they didn't have. There are all kinds of negative perceptions. Most of them are not true of the men and women that I've met in the profession. But that doesn't matter. Perception is reality. And part of that perception is because of some of the problems I noted earlier. I think it's time for a paradigm paradigmatic shift. I think it's time to move the field away from what it does. And Jim Wetzel has gotten me to understand something that I didn't think of before. But it's the model of scarcity versus the model of abundance, right? We always think of scarcity. So, Sergey, you write an article for the journal, the most prestigious journal of engineering, you know, in Russia. Now, anywhere you want to write it, okay? And do you say, and they are so open to everything I'm going to write? No. They're going to tell you, because almost all journals brag about, not about what they publish, we brag about what we don't publish. So when I was an editor, I used to go up and I go, I know all my fellow editors have told you all, this, all their rejection rates. I'm going to tell you about the good articles that we publish. But they don't. It's a model of scarcity. And we buy into that. And I've met lots of people, particularly students here at Villanova, will say, by the time I'm 35, we don't say millionaire. Well, they still say millionaire, but they don't mean it. A million dollars doesn't do much for you in the United States anymore. Um, well, it may get you a, bu a little bungalow on the main line. But at any rate, um, they would say, I want to be independently wealthy by the time I'm 35. Well, go meet them at 35. Fast forward another 12 or 13 years. Then they go, you know, if I only had $5 million in the bank, I could, I could, do some, I could spend more time with my family. Keep fast forwarding. You know? I have worked with hundreds of managers in talks that I've given all over the world. And I will tell you one thing about managers at the end of their life, except for one man, the Bob Nydick's father-in-law. None of them have ever said to me, God, I wish I had made more money. I wish I'd had more authority. I wish I'd been more powerful. I wish I'd had a better title. They say two things over and over and over again, to the point where I just have to nod as they say it to me. I wish I had spent more time with my family. 
the most successful people I know. I wish I had spent more time with my family. And I wish I was leaving by, behind a legacy of having done something of value to society. And so I keep thinking, well, where was all that along the way? You know, it wasn't there. It wasn't there because you don't go into corporate life and they say to you, well, sometimes they'll talk about balance. And there are some firms that say, we're a balanced organization. But what they really mean is, at the end of the day, it's the people that perform the hard chargers that get the meat. You know, everybody else is eating oatmeal. You can say you want balance. Yeah. Uh, I don't live a balanced life. I never understood what that is. I try to do things I'm passionate about as much as I can. But this whole idea of we go into this place and it's built on scarcity, not abundance. When you're a multi-billion dollar firm, do you really think that your bioeconomic footprint in the, in the world in which you operate can be defined by a gift of $20 million to 15 different groups or 30 different groups somewhere in a community? Can it be? And what happens to organizations that concentrate on the well-being of the people they serve versus satisfaction, the idea of consumer satisfaction, which is an interesting concept in and of itself. It basically says, at the end of the day, the money you gave up, hopefully you believe what you got in return was worth more. Now, I don't know if that's a particularly good deal. You know, it's certainly not, an, it's certainly not a equal deal because we have no idea. There's no equality. We don't know about equality. Maybe we think it's, un, it's inequitable if what you gave up is not as good as what you got. Okay? But it certainly doesn't go to the heart of who you are as a human being. Nor does it get to the heart of who people in marketing are either, because they're not, they're not a group of bad people running around trying to find ways to hoodwink people. They're caught up in a system that only has certain kinds of values. And so let me finish by talking about this issue of naivety and self-interest. So I was in this conference, um, not Seattle, Tacoma, Washington, several years ago. It was a CSR conference. I got invited to be the marketing person on this panel. And I told him exactly what I thought, which wouldn't surprise you, um, was just very different than anybody else on the panel. So one of the persons said to me on the panel, I think it was the accounting professor, he said, that's unrealistic. And I go, I'm a professor. And I said, do you want me to just go to, the, go to what's possible? You know, I, I'm going to go to what, what it should look like. Because I know you can't get there by imagining anything less. I know that when I started working at Greaterford, uh, some of the men would say to me, because I would, I, I would say to them, well, what do we want to change? And they go, ah, oh, you can't change that. And I go, do you mean to tell me you're letting the administration here control your dreams? Do you stay awake at night saying, no, I can't do that, and no, I can't do that, and no, I'll never get that? I said, why, why don't we vision a better place and see if we can't get to that better place? I guess what I'm trying to say, it's not naive for everybody to try to actualize who they are. The marketing, the men and women in marketing that I have met, for the most part, want to, and at some point may have tried to, make the world around them a better place by what they do. And most people, when they connect with the marketplace, are trying to help themselves live a better life as a result of it. Why can't we visualize a model like that? You're worth billions of dollars for some of these firms. You going to use a scarcity mentality? Is Pepsi going to sit around and say, oh, we just lost half a market share, half a point of market share to Coca-Cola? It's a tragedy, just a tragedy. Is it really? Is it really? Or are you creating this artificial domain? I'm not suggesting firms don't be competitive. I'm not suggesting firms not be profitable. What I am suggesting is that the incorporation of a higher set of values into what their promise is is, going, is a better proposition. And it's because I'm looking now at Scandinavia. I'm looking at Europe. I'm looking at the United Nations. 
Look at what they're tracking with people now. It's well-being. It's happiness and life satisfaction. And they're looking at how people are intersecting with that. And they're intervening in the marketplace if they feel that that is being compromised. Now, we've done that for a long time with certain kinds of products, but now we're looking at other products as well. We're looking at other ways in which the marketplace serves or fail to, fails to serve who you are. And I think it explains why this will have difficulty. Uh, so, uh, you know, everybody's seen this. You must be the change you wish to see in the world. Okay, so that's pretty cliche now, but it's still wonderful, isn't it? You know? What, I asked my graduating seniors here three years ago. I'll never forget it about, I don't know, Greg, what, I get 25, 35 in a room, right, at the most, 35. This is my first day of class. They're all graduating seniors. I said, close your eyes. And I said, now imagine yourself unimpeded doing the thing in life that would bring you the most joy as an occupation. I don't care if you have to drive a 10-year-old car versus a new Mercedes. I don't, just imagine yourself in that place. Okay, now open your eyes. How many of you are trying to get there? One hand went up. Now, you can't dream at 20 or 21 years old. I, I, think, we, I think we limit the vision of our students in some way. And I, and I have to say, Jim Wetzel and I have been teaching this course called The Philosophy of Exchange for the last, uh, this is our third year? So we're done, so I'm either get on the books or we're done. I think you had to do it three years, right? Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, we'll just keep we'll just keep moving the aperture. We'll call it the philosophy of exchange. Yeah, right? yeah that's right. Philosophy of business enterprises. Um, when I when I've been working with Jim, one of the things we've been doing is talking about exchange. We start with a symposium, and we move through a variety of very difficult texts to understand. And the students struggle all along because they think they know what it means. They think they know what it means to be in marketing. But what they fail to do is to challenge the underlying propositions. It's like in our society today. Imagine a candidate for president saying, I think there are problems with capitalism and getting elected. It's got to be, God bless America, we're the greatest nation in the history of the world. It's this elitism of our country which I think is going to help and in, in the, in the generation of the students here may lead to our ultimate downfall as a superpower, as an economic superpower. Because we're afraid to look at the underpinnings of it and question it. It becomes like God to question it. And the same thing in my field. When, uh, when this editor looked at it, his, his thing was, oh, I really like it. And so it's a problem. You've got to you got to visualize the change. And this is the thing that I have the most difficulty with my students. Change is the law of life, and those who only look to the past or the present are certain to miss the future. Okay, so, you know, I'm a baby boomer, grew up with JFK. And one of the things that I like about this is for so many of us, we hold on to those things that are, that we hope, that we have the illusion can be stable in our lives the illusion that it's the center of what we do. I tried to say that we have, not, we have not had a theory article in our field since the early 70s, but probably the 60s, that's taken exception to the, to the theory of exchange and marketing. It was written by Kotler back then, Bogosian and some of these other guys went out and wrote about it, and then it died. There's no more conversation. It's like, okay, we've, we've discovered truth, therefore we don't need to look at it anymore. You know, and we're in, a, we're in a rapidly different world than we were at the time. Okay, so thank you all. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to say, um, but you're certainly welcome to. I'm leaving them speechless.
what is with the single? I mean, I'm sure that, that you must find value in, um, in a different one. Sure. Because you're, you know, working really hard at it. Sure. But most of what we heard today was about what's, what's you know, what, what needs to be corrected. Um, so what, what is the discipline got right? Um, do you want to answer it? Supermarket and get all kinds of food from all around the world, and you make good food, you feed yourself very well at a relatively cheap price compared to the rest of the world. And that's what, what, one of the things the market does is get the right product at the right price for the right people. So I think that's a pretty simple thing to look at. And, and I sometimes wonder when I buy something for 25 cents or 30 cents, and I go, how could it have gotten here for that amount of money? Now, I'm not, I don't, and I agree, uh, there's an article written in our field by Bill Wilkie and Betsy Moore, and they chronicle the history of the marketing profession and the rise of our standard of living. But I only take, and I took a little bit of exception to it in this article, because that rise in our standard of living has been to an elite group in society. I mean, even in the United States, if you look at the underclass in the United States, um, their, sp their ability to buy has actually decreased since the 1970s, but the top 5% has increased dramatically. There's also, it's a very efficient system for some, but it leaves out 6 billion people in terms of the, some of the efficiencies Greg is talking about. So, you know, I would say that it does serve a particular part of humanity very well. If you, want to, if you want me to tell you what I think it does right, I think that we have the technology to do, and the ability now to do anything we would want to do. I think we could feed everybody, we could clothe everybody, we could give health care to everybody, and we could do it in a way that will allow us to not disadvantage people at the top nearly as much as we would advantage people at the bottom. But we have no collective will to do that. The developed West has no collective will to do that. So I probably shouldn't say this, but I was with a group of undergraduates one day, and I said to them, so why are you at Villanova? And they go, well, you know, I looked around, and I looked at Syracuse, and I go, I go no, 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 no. You're at Villanova, and we don't give any money to anybody. We give 10 people scholarships, so you're paying a lot of money to come here. What if your parents instead sent you to Monmouth College and took the rest of that money and transferred it to some individ set of individuals at the bottom of the pyramid, what would life look like? I go, well, Monmouth is not nearly as good as Villanova. Okay, how much, how much worse is it, Monmouth College, than Villanova? And you'd work really hard because you're a really hardworking person, so wouldn't you graduate at the top of the class? And, and it's really interesting. So these are 20-year-old, 21-year-old kids. They, they would say things to me like, well, wait a second. My dad worked really hard to get me here. And boy, I did with my kids. One went to medical school and the other one's at LaSalle and I've paid billions of dollars in, in tuition. I made my last undergraduate tuition payment in January. God love me. I'm getting a big raise next year. At any rate, you know, they'll say, and my dad works hard. He goes, he, he does all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. And I go, I didn't say your dad didn't work hard. I just said, what would the world look like if you did that? Well, and you know, a lot of people at the bottom, they just don't care as much. And and I said, so, hmm. And I said, so, poor is evil. We're good. We work really hard. I said, how many kids in your family went to college? Well, everybody goes to college. Well, I'll, I'll drive you to West Philly. I can, get, I can get you there in, you know, a few minutes from here. And I can show you families where they can't even visualize. I have one guy, Omar. He's a really bright guy. Um, he's, in, he's in jail and uh, or prison. And he said, I knew a lot of people in prison growing up, but I didn't know one person going to college. And it was in West Philadelphia. You could throw a rock and hit four schools, right? Now, I'm not saying that it's our job to create, a, necessarily create some kind of justice there, necessarily. But I am wondering if we should do more than we're doing now. If there's more that we can do as global organizations? Or is there more we should do as global organizations? Anyone else want to say anything? Yes, my friend. Yeah. I, I'm wondering about your talk about the individual. Uh, in my mind, marketers are going to get way too close to the uh, individual. 
Of course they do. Right. Do you have a different view, or what exactly do you think? My, my view is that, in general, marketers want to know what you are, not who you are. This is the distinction we've been, we've been working on in Aaron's book on the human condition in the class that I teach with Jim. So it's, it's quintessentially American to go into a cocktail party, right, and people will say, so what do you do? And it always bothers my wife because she never went back to work. And I said, just tell him, you do me, I do you, and we do well together. And she said, no, that's not going to work for me. So I used to say I'm a professor, and people would say to me, that's amazing because I'm a CFO, and when I retire, I want to be a professor. And I, and I used to get really worked up about it. Oh, you don't know all the stuff we have to do as professors. And I change it now. So now I just say when they, I say I'm a professor, and they say, Oh, I, want, I go, that's amazing because when I retire, I want to be a CFO of a major company. You know, it's just, that's just like, you, nine to five, you guys, weekends off, holidays, you, after Thanksgiving, you're not doing anything. I said, I'm busy as hell all the way up to the, what is it, the fifth when our grades are due? I'm taking a couple of days off. Um, I'm now saying I'm an astronaut, though. That works really well. <laughs> and, I, and I've said recently, I, I have a circus of all golden retriever puppies. I thought that would be would make me sound very good. But that's, that's the issue, because it, what we're asking you for is, what's the mask you wear in life? You know, that allows you to go out in, a public, in, in the public forum and exist. They don't want to know who you are. And, that's, and uh, you and I argue about a variety of stuff on the bike, right? We'll talk about a variety of things. And uh, Jules is a professor. He works here. But we also cycle together, at least when it's warm out. Uh, he, he's, He's Dutch, so he'll cycle in anything. But uh, one of the things that worries me is the problem is they want to know what you are, not who you are. There's an intimacy to who you are that suggests a deep and abiding concern. But what you are doesn't suggest that. That, that suggests an attempt to take something from you, to extract something from you, even if it is to give you something else in return. I mean. That's okay. And our field has said, well, that's what they call it, mutually, mutually satisfactory exchange relationships. I don't know. I, I've, I've yet to figure out what that means. Um, but I know what they think it means. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. I don't know much about marketing, but when they talk about how the mask is going to make changes in the way things are in the world, so yeah. how is marketing used in shaping our personal thoughts? Just to give you one example, I read yesterday that the advanced F-35 fighter Million-dollar project in its website, yeah. million dollars. And now I'm hearing on NPR all these uh, military spokesmen talking about all these civilians are going to have to be furloughed. You know, the military budget is oh, we're going to be in danger after a year. Th how can we make change if people are using marketing to shape how most people think about whether they're in danger, mm -hmm. whether they need protection, where our resources mm -hmm. are going? Marketing is used to shape how we vote. Yeah, it, it's funny. Well, the, the, the Republican National Committee puts out its talking points and before the talk shows on Sunday, and you'll hear them over and over again repeating them, right? I mean, Obamacare is a good example. How, how, can, we vilify, how can we vilify giving people an opportunity to get health care? The way we do it is by saying government's going to control your health care. Uh, th there's no reality in that other than they're going to require you to have health care, but they require us to do lots of other kinds of things because it serves the... It serves the better of humankind. Um, the problem in those cases is it's all about manipulation. And that's where, that's what bothers you. When you create an illusion that is self-serving, that purposely misguides, then I don't think anyone in our profession would say that that's right. So the Patriot Act, the Patriot Act is a good example. The Bush administration was good for it. But let me tell you, so is Obama. They're all the same. Okay, I mean, I voted for Obama, I'm a Democrat, but at the end of the day, they're all virtually the same. The Patriot Act, as you well know, was an act that took away our constitutional rights. You know, Operation Iraqi Freedom, okay? Well, the Iraqis didn't ask us to free them, you know, and they say, oh, no, the average Iraqi does. 
Well, we know now that a lot of that was built on a ruse, and it was about language. So I haven't talked about politics, but politics is probably one of the areas where we have the greatest incivility. So Michael Capella and I are working on an article now looking at incivility in the political discourse. It's something he and I talked about for a while, and, we're, and we, our research assistant, God love her, when we, we tried to look at ads during the whole campaign, couldn't do it. I said, look, social media, look at all the, it, it, the cornucopia stuff was too great. So now she's focusing on just 30-second television ads from the end of the, um, uh, from the end of the debates, no, not debates, end of the um, conventions, yeah, till the election. She went through 350 30-second commercials. The level of incivility in them and we're looking at some pretty good research, although I think it misses some things, that talks about what does incivility mean. Incivility is when you make a set of statements that are unfounded in fact. Now, it's not, there's a lot of lying, there's a lot of fact checking goes on, but that's separate, okay? But it's when you're, you're making statements that cannot be verified or, or proven true or false, you know, that smear another candidate, right? And it's become, it's become a very polarizing thing in our society. And they're all marketers. You know, they're, pro they're probably the sle I think I view them as the sleaziest side of our profession. Um, and they move, from, they move from candidate to candidate. You know, they go overseas and work with people and then come back here for a while, you know. Um, and it's, I've seen it in my lifetime. I mean, it was always posturing, right? But you watch from Kennedy till today, the political dialogue, the conversations we're allowed to have now, and the polarization is things like, you know, capitalism is the same as God. Um, having, having guns that have the ability to shoot a thousand rounds in a second um, is equivalent to supporting the Constitution. You know, we've wrapped all these things up, we've paired all these things up in, th in ways that are no better than a beer commercial that shows a bunch of bikini-clad women. It's no better. It's saying, okay, I, I, we have so many beers out there, you're not going to look at this one, so let's show a group of scantily clad women because we know men will turn their heads. It, it's about as obvious as that. Um, I, I can't solve it. I won't solve it. Um, I think the, the, what I'd love to see is a candidate that was as honest. I don't, I don't like Ron Paul, though we have the same name. Um, I don't particularly agree with Ron Paul, but at least he says what he thinks. You know, he doesn't sit around and min, you know, mince words with you. That's why he'll never be elected. Right? You can't tell the truth. You've got you to gotta maintain the illusion of, of radical individualism in this country and radical exceptionalism of the nation. And anything other than that is questioning whether or not God exists for this country. It's, it's a very, very frightening time. I'm no politician, so I was a crummy dean. I don't have, I used to tell people what I thought. It was really, it's a bad trait, really a bad trait among deans anyway. All right, well, it's been, it's been so real, it's been surreal. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>